So this is Arguing Adventures, and we're really excited. Um, we've got a great program today talking about murals in the mission, and we have a, a um, prominent mural artist with us today, Josue Rojas. Um, and we're going to do, but this is really being done to celebrate uh, Latino Heritage Month, which has been going on. Um, it's also Indigenous Peoples Day today. And I know, I think that's something in your art also, Josue, I've seen um, depictions relating to that. That's true. Yeah, I always try to include some um, some images of indigeneity and kind of a pre-Columbian experience, um, just to sort of honor honor the Native Americans, which is kind of an ongoing theme with mission murals as well. And, and yeah. it, it needs to be said, Nikki, that you really were the one pushing for a program that celebrated Latino heritage. I was totally in favor of it because because you know this is such an important artistic uh, tradition. Um, in in San Francisco, which of course ties to um, the Mexican muralists and Pan American Unity, that that great mural at SF MoMA. But we're joined by Josue Rojas, who is a very established muralist in San Francisco. I, I know you've been doing this for for quite some time, Josue, and you've got many works in the Mission and maybe elsewhere. Um, but we really want to thank you for coming on the show and talking to us about. Uh, this art that you've created that beautifies our city and um, provides really important cultural links for all of us. Um, so, Josue, welcome to Art Viewing Adventures. Thank you, Rodney. Thank you for having me. Thank you to everyone for joining us. Thank you, Nikki, for that great uh, those great words of introduction, and uh, really grateful um, for this entire opportunity and to be able to be here and share some of my work with you all. I want to extend gratitude to uh, the original peoples on Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, this is their, you know, it's their unceded land, and I want to show uh, love and respect to those who came before. Uh, also, shout out to my immigrant people. You know, I think as we celebrate Latino Heritage Month, people who are uh, here from different parts of the world, I want to celebrate that, and uh, I'm happy to share some artwork um, of the place that I represent. I am deeply deeply um, in love and represent San Francisco. I consider myself a San Franciscan. I've been here since, I don't know, maybe I was like 11, um, not 11, maybe a year and a half old and uh, learned how to walk um, on these streets. And that really is a big contributor to why I think I became an artist and uh, the things that I saw growing up in this beautiful city. So, so you grew up um, in the mission with all, you know, these murals around you. That's um, right. When did you decide that you were going to follow in the footsteps of these other muralists and become become a mural muralist yourself? And who inspired you? Yeah, well, you know, um, I current I studied art. I went to art uh, school for, for several years. I have a, a bachelor's from the California College of Arts and Crafts and a master's from Boston University. And I've had some, you know, some success showing my work in museums. But before any of that, really, it was just the streets, uh, being able to see my see work in my neighborhood that reflected my experience in the streets and the, the key sort of purveyor of that artwork is murals. And so I was very lucky, uh, even when I was, um, you know, didn't grow up with a lot of money, but I grew up with a culturally rich space and spaces like the Mission really provide that experience. And so I was really lucky about the age of 15, but I was going through a lot of tumult in my life. I lost my dad. I lost my cousin. I had a lot of loss in my family. I went through an illness. Um, I had a lot of uh, pent up emotion or pent up really power, you know, if you think about it. And that was when I met Presida Eyes. And so just to clarify, I don't currently represent Presida Eyes. I am now um, an independent artist, but I was uh, trained by them in my teen years. And I was there for the establishing of their urban youth arts class. So really, street art and graffiti really uh, were my sort of segue uh, into the arts. Are you guys able to see the screen? Yes. So I'm showing you here a little yes, bit. Um, all right. Thank you, Paco. Uh, able able to show you here, um, not unlike inspired by the art of Hung Lu. Uh, if you know her work, that was yeah. just up at, uh, at the Dia. Here's my uh, resident alien card. And my signature here. So when I was a when I was a youngster, I think being an immigrant is a big part of my art and my process. Um, jumping right in, I think one of my more prominent works is at Balmy Alley. I don't know if you all know what Balmy Alley is, but that really is one that really kind of um, 
tell, tell us a little, I mean, I know it, but tell us just in case someone out there doesn't, like where where is it? How do you get to it? Yeah, Balmy Alley is located on, um, on the corner of 24th Street and Balmy, not far from Harrison Street, uh, um, also not far from Treat Street. And it is the original alley. I know if you've taken a walk through the Mission or through San Francisco, you see that mural alleys are kind of, um, uh, there's a lot of them. You know, there's several of them. There's at least, I'd say, about eight. Um, Clarion Alley is a very prominent um, um, uh, mural sort of environment. But I think the first one is Balmy Alley. And Balmy Alley is important because in the 70s and 80s, it was a place where a lot of the Chicano muralists and muralists were able to sort of place uh, to cover the entire wall, to plaster murals all on, on the entire alley and take it over with beauty. And so it turned this previously kind of gnarly or dark uh, alley into a beautiful place uh, where, you know, the community's values and politics and um, beauty is shared. And so I was able to put put together a mural that celebrated uh, that celebrated the same spirit with Balmy Alley, in which Balmy Alley was uh, inaugurated. And so I knew that I had to do it about um, about central uh, the Central American experience. So this piece is dedicated to the young migrants of the mission. And as you can see here on the left, there's a cover of a book called Enrique's Journey. Uh -huh. So it is a great um, it's a great book that won the Pulitzer Prize by journalist Sonia Nazario, and it it was about a young man's journey to uh, to reunite with his mother. So if you read the mural here, usually you read a mural the way you read a book from left to right. In this case, you're reading it from right to left. And there's just a young person here on the top of a train, which is how some of these migrants travel. Um, they travel the length of Mexico riding on the top, like the exterior of a train um, to, to, to cover a lot of miles. And so the young man's question wasn't like, you know, I'm, I'm not migrating because you know, I want, um, I want a better life or I want this and that. He just really wanted to figure out whether or not his mom loved him because a lot of, uh, unfortunately, the trends and seeing the way, the way globalization works, when someone migrates from a place like Central America or Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, they come and they work really hard and they send money back home so that the kids can, you know, go to school or have food to eat. But the, the kids really, what they miss is having a parent around. And that's the case with uh, Enrique. He just really wanted to, in this true life story, just kind of, kind of coming in and wonder if his mother still loved him. And so I uh, I, I put in real people here, uh, people in the community here. Um, and uh, in this case, the mother figure is represented by a young artist and activist named um, Nancy Peely. And she here she's like, her has her arm extended and, and embraced for, to meet um, young Enrique, uh, who's uh, personified by my nephew I had to get some real models here and I photographed these pieces and I put it up um, being kind of uh, trained in the Presida Eyes community style of work I always work with uh, people in the community in this case uh, many times it's family and so here you see my mother kind of jumping in and joining in helping uh, in the process of painting here's some of my uh, reference work so here's my nephew Isaiah who's now I think he's about nine years old when this happened He's now probably 26, 27, and uh, a father. So this is a this is a two thousand nine shot of him. So the uh, mural's seventeen years old. Mural I started in 08. Uh -huh. About um, if you do the math, oh, so it's something like, like thirteen. Yeah, fifteen years yeah. old. Yeah, and so um, yeah, and then you see if you see on the right here is a photo of this guardian angel these two children crossing a broken bridge and um that really um it, it really sort of speaks to you know going through peril going through danger and uh you know the kids are crossing this broken bridge they're barefoot and they don't even realize that they're being protected and so i really wanted to show that in this image right the idea that this young migrant is crossing but there's a measure of protection there um you know in spirituality and stuff so i really wanted to sort of show that um i thought it would be something that people could relate to um you know a lot of times you make a mural you don't hear back uh now with social media you hear back immediately and there's a lot of feedback to the work but but you know before that there wasn't much of that and so uh i didn't know you know i wanted just to, to i wanted people really to read this book i wanted people to sort of sympathize with the story by doing this mural i really wanted to um people to just sort of pick this up and and, and understand the stories of, of young migrants and 
you know, I did this in 09 when, you know, some of the first huge waves of Central Americans started to come on the, on, on the southern border. And, you know, it's only become more relevant over the years. Um, even, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a hot item topic in the news, even this morning, right, about what's going on on the borders and, and, and the young migrants making their way. But um, I wanted this to be a tribute to these young migrants and these young heroes, um, because I do feel that people who migrate when the conditions are dangerous or when the conditions are miserable in their uh, countries, uh, I feel that migrants are heroes. They're, 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 they're human rights advocates for themselves. And so I really wanted to honor them. And so I didn't realize how deep that would go because young people were, um, were invited to do a collection of poems that would um, be love letters to mission murals uh, through a writer's corps program. And if you see on the bottom right of these here slides, um, the young people through uh, the young students of um, Sanchez Elementary wrote poems to the murals. And they were actually literally saying that this is my story. They weren't saying I identify with this. They were saying this was how I got here. This is how uh, I, I made it to this country. And so I thought it was such a powerful um, kind of a virtuous circle of art where the book inspired the mural the mural inspired the the young students and uh, and then we got another book out of this and so it's kind of this uh, inspirational sort of virtuous circle and so here's you can find this article if you just do a search under San Francisco Chronicle in my name and then you, you can see this uh, these young kids writing their poems one of my big uh, mentors is Juana Alicia I worked with her for a couple of years I was uh, she's uh, you know um, as Nikki shared, she is a uh, has a currently uh, an exhibition up uh, through the Arts Commission. You might see her work. Uh, Susan Cervantes is another great hero. She's on the top left. She's the founder of Presida Eyes. Um, right below her on the bottom left is Estria Miyashiro and Vogue. Uh, they're some of the most prominent uh, and proficient uh, aerosol artists. So they're street artists who also trained me. Uh, if you look at the top center of the black and white photo, that's Rene Yanez, uh, who was one of the founders of Galeria de la Raza. Here he is wearing a, a wrestler's mask, a Mexican wrestler's mask. Um, beneath him with the gray hair uh, is Juan Alicia once again. Uh, on the top right corner is Yolanda Lopez, who Nikki mentioned, who has two exhibits up. Like she mentioned, one up at, U, uh, at, UC, at USF and another at the San Jose Museum. Um, and there's the Guadalupe breaking out, the, vir the virgin kind of Guadalupe breaking out. The last one I'll mention is the bottom uh, right, uh, just a little bit left of the, of the actual corner is Claudia Bernardi. Claudia Bernardi was my mentor and she studied, uh, I studied with her at the California College of Arts and Crafts. And she really dives into almost, um, it's almost like jarring how deep she goes into the intersection of human rights um, and art. And her intersection of, uh, of those interests of human rights and art really get to the why I make art. You know, I think um, a lot of teaching art for me has been like, how do you do it, right? Like, how do you make a mural? How do you solve the problems of getting up on a ladder and making it accurate to your design and all this stuff? But a lot of the artwork too is why. Like, why do you need this mural here? Why does this public artwork need to exist? And um, Claudia Bernardi really gave me that tool. I think her approach to human rights and art um, really uh, was burned into my mind. I have to say another big one of my sheroes is um, Sandy Close. Uh, Sandy Close was the founder of the Pacific News Service, also known it, it, it later changed its name to the uh, uh, New America Media. And I was a young communicator, a young media maker, a young reporter with them from about the ages of 17 to about 31. So I was with them about 13, 14 years. Uh, and I learned, uh, I, I, I paid my way through college and I, I made my living for the, uh, in my 20s and early 30s as a journalist. So I have that combined interest of doing journalism and art. All right, going right to it. One of my latest, most recent works. Uh, Nikki, you might recognize this. This is my tribute to Yolanda Lopez. And so yeah. I am I am good friends with uh, Rio Yanez, who's her son. He's mm -hmm. about my age. 
he's exactly my age actually and rio is an only child and during her last uh her last few months of life and she was diagnosed uh, with her illness rio put out a community call and asked for people to uh in the community to help care for her so she wouldn't be alone uh during her last moments and so i really got to have some quality time with her uh in her last uh, her last few months and really learned from her a lot and uh love her very much. So there's many, there's many tributes to her um, because she is such a powerful figure and, and an iconic figure uh, and a hero to many. And so uh, not many of them show her in her youth or display much of her works. And so there is an amazing one. I want to give all love and, and respect and props to Jessica Sabogal. And it's on 14th and Folsom. If you look up, there's a huge portrait of Yolanda's face. Um, you can see that one in the Mission District, 14th and Folsom. Um, but I wanted to do one that's it, that was her and her youth. So here she is, um, like Nikki said, in, in the Guadalupe Halo. And, you know, by the standards of 2023, um, putting yourself in the halo of the Virgin, it may not be terribly shocking or revolutionary. Um, but in the 60s and 70s, when Yolanda did this, it was absolutely groundbreaking and Mm -hmm. uh, earth shattering and um, and scary for many people and so her son Rio shared with me that a lot of the galleries that would show this work uh, got calls and death threats uh, uh, because it was so radical um, and so yeah she's um, always a voice in my head kind of encouraging me to go on and so this piece was just completed um, uh, in the fall of, of 2022 um, and, and I had to where is it located? So this is um, right next to the Parque de los Niños on 23rd and Folsom. And it's a huge abandoned building that I was given license to paint. And so uh, the owner was preoccupied with getting um, getting graffiti, you know, off of his building. And so I said, the one thing that's going to keep graffiti off, because now, unfortunately, there's this terrible trend happening where it used to be that you would put up a mural and the graffiti writers would would respect it. But I think since COVID, there's been a lot more of defacing of even murals. And so there must be a lot some intentionality around um, around the mural that you make so that even the graffiti writers that are more brazen will respect it. And so a tribute to one of our sheroes um, and some of her amazing work like Basta. Yeah, I can go. I can just talk about this just this particular mural for, for days. But the work that she did with Basta, yeah, which was a publication. Um, the Free Los Siete campaign, where she, she, it was one of the movements that really galvanized the mission in activism, where seven young Central American young people, young men, were accused of killing a police officer, and it was it was trumped up charges and stuff, and the community really rallied around them, and uh, uh, Yolanda and Donna Amador and several other young uh, activists at that moment um, took the case to heart and really... Um, galvanize the community in a Black Panther style, Black Panther inspired activism where they gave breakfast, where they had breakfast programs, education programs, and um, politically active uh, uh, content in this in this newspaper called Basta Ya. The last one that I'll have to mention, and you can see this piece at the San Jose, you see her, the figure running kind of off oh. of the mural. It is a self-portrait, and I think it's where Yolanda got some of her ideas to sort of dress up as a virgin, but in running, in a woman in running clothes, and Yolanda's spirit of um, experiencing freedom um, through running, through so through active movement, you know. And so, the, just wanted to get some of her, her, uh, some of her greatest hits here. There she is running. Uh, the last little piece I'll mention: you see the beige poster that says "Who's the Immigrant Pilgrim." It's one of her most radical sort of pieces. It's very confrontational. The the Indian, um, the native figure sort of pointing at you, tearing up um, immigration papers uh, in this kind of Uncle Sam, like, you know, who are you? What are you up to? This kind of pointing and confrontational. But I always was haunted and shocked and, and felt very empowered by the uh, who are you calling an immigrant, an illegal alien pilgrim, right? It really is... Um, it really speaks to the spirit of Yolanda and I wanted to include that in this mural and I had uh, many, many artists help me with this. Here's a close up. There's my mom again helping. She's in this case, it, there's a lot of wildlife and plants on this uh, wall. So she's kind of just sweeping it away and cleaning it up. But there's kind of a portrait there. Uh, here's another one, just kind of close up. 
Uh, oh, this is a video. So here, uh, you can see it here. It'll give you kind of an idea of scale. This is a drone shot that my friend Harvey took. Just to show you kind of more or less just how big this is. This is, I haven't even measured this. It's no little, it's no no less than, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe 70, 70 feet tall. Sorry, 70 feet long by about 20 feet tall. And there it is. There you can see 23rd Street. So do you have to go into the park to be able to see it? Like you can't really see, you have to you have to see it from the street. It's the best way you can see it. You uh, there's a huge gate there and it's private property. So um you know, actually technically this this piece it's on the bathroom. That that this structure here is the bathroom um of the Parque de los Niños. And I got a letter from I got a call a phone call actually from Parks and Rec and they were telling me that um I didn't have permission to do this mural. That technically it was illegal, uh, even though they can't they can't even access the space. But then they said we'll send you the paperwork to make sure that it's legal because we love it. We want to keep it. And so that was one of those uh, ask for permission uh, for forgiveness and not permission moments that actually worked out for me. Um, here is uh, a detail of a project that I did with uh, some students and some friends over at Downtown High School, which I attended. I attended many high schools in San Francisco, but Downtown Continuation High School is one of them, and this is in the Petrero. Um, and it features, as you can see, um, a young black woman and a young brown woman um, in graduation attire, uh, feeling very empowered, very defiant. And here they are. Um, uh, Downtown High School's mission is to really get kids graduated, right? Get them credit so they can graduate. And so uh, we really wanted just to honor that work that they do there and here it is. This is also I can go on for days about, but I'd rather show you. I'll show you volume as well. So I want to show you many works here. You know the words "be the change" and graffiti. Um, yeah, they have like these amazing crafts programs where they do a lot of sewing and woodwork, uh, outdoor stuff. You know, I really love this space. Here's here's a drone shot of this piece, just again for scale. You see the basketball court there. Um, for scales, you can see really how uh, really massive this piece is. It takes up that whole schoolyard. Uh, I'm in negotiations right now to take over uh, several more of downtown high school's walls. Uh, maybe we can paint that whole campus as is, it is should that, be. Is that stuff that people can see or do you have to go on the campus to be able you, to? You'd have to be going on campus. So I think you have to basically see it from the streets. But here it is. This is the uh, Petrero Hill uh, area, if you know. San Francisco. It's adjacent to the mission, but it's not in the mission proper. What's what are the uh, cross streets? That is Kansas and eighteen. Okay. Yeah. Um, here's a fun one that I did. Here's another drone shot. This is the uh, the same park, the same building at the Parque de los Niños. Uh -huh. This is a drone shot. Uh, there's no there's no less than twenty five artists of the they're called the city art crew the ca crew um one other great way to abate graffiti is to do an organized graffiti mural so here we're doing one there was a young man who passed away from the ca crew his name is spider so we wanted to honor him by doing a spider-man mural and so the mural is themed after kind of in the comic book style so everyone's there each one of these little frames is able to have its own color scheme its own style uh, I really went all out. I didn't really have a lot of funds, but I rented two lifts, two scissor lifts, or the ones that go up and down on the wall. Uh, I rented a porta potty. We got some food going. We had like a you know barbecue and picnic, and for two solid weekends, actually ended up being more like three. We covered this huge, huge wall. It ended up being this is in the graffiti world is called a production, and it's not when it's just a single graffiti, but it's like when it's several different artists brought together and a piece that can really um, brought together in a piece that really shows uh, like an organized theme. And so comics need, is, is particularly the theme here. Um, so up until this point, I've showed you works that sort of combine or that utilize techniques uh, in the traditional realm. I showed you brush murals and I've showed you spray paint murals separately. Um, this piece actually combines both on in one wall so uh i know that some of you all know the celebration of carnival that it's um i believe it's 45 years old now the the 
the big outdoor celebration that happens um, on Labor Day weekend in the mission. Um, the headquarters for, uh, for Carnival are on this new building. And this building is a new uh, affordable housing building that was put up in the mission uh, in 2022. And as it was put up, uh, there was a call for murals. And so we did that one. Uh, myself, designer, uh, along with Cece Carpio and uh, Miguel Perez and several other assistants, we did this mural here. Uh, and it is a hummingbird and a Maya well. It's a, a celebration of the Mission District. There we are, kind of a rare in-progress shot. Uh, we're very tiny compared to this wall. Let me show you. If you look at that tiny uh, building, there's there it is again. So... Um, this one was very scary for me because we were using a thing called a swing stage. And so it's a platform, as you can see, it drops. It, instead of climbing, it, it's, it's not a type of scaffold where you climb from the bottom to the top. It's one that you drop from the top of the building off the side of the building. Uh, and it moves a lot and the wind shakes it a lot. And it's pretty scary. And you have to wear a harness. You see me there in the center wearing a harness just in case you fall off. Uh, definitely a learning curve there and had to, you know, wear protective gear and the hot, the heat and the wind, it's all kind of elements that we're working with and against. Oh, we, we have um, a question, Josue. Um, sure. how, how long do, um, I mean, I suppose they all take different amounts of time, but um, for example, how long did this mural take and, and what is the range of time? To they take a long time. It's a lot of times too, you know, um, for me and my experience, people, um, People respect and love a mural, but they are, it, they almost don't know how to, the process works. You have to kind of lean on the artist to understand how one can do it. I mean, generally, I've done murals that take one day and I've been in murals that take, a, you know, a year, depending on the size, the scale or the complexity. So um, in order to stay busy and have a full schedule, sometimes I need to double and triple book. So the murals that I just showed you, they were all done kind of simultaneously. They were all done within maybe a six month space in 2022. So uh, this one right here that you're looking at, this here took about maybe four months, uh, working about three days a week. Um, and some days were canceled due to power outages. I mean, they were still building the building when they, when they let us do it. So it was a construction site. Uh, you know, this one took um, three, perhaps four weekends, but, you know, that's like within a space of a month, right? So it's like you're working on it and then, you know, and this one took no less than 90 days. Wow. And so the summer of 2022 was very physical for me. I was uh, home, come home sore every night um, from just working in the hot sun and making these very, very physical works. And then um, I went from directly from doing this one, which was 10 stories in the air, 10 stories tall, to doing this one, which is on the ground. And so I don't know if you guys know that uh, the JFK promenade at Golden Gate Park mm -hmm. is now yeah. completely closed to cars. <laughs> yeah. And they, they opened it for there's, people. There's to mixed walk feelings it. in this group about that. But yeah, there is some mixed feelings about it. I understand that some people, you know, it's an access issue, but. It's also expands, uh, I guess, the, the ability to have more foot traffic. And mm -hmm. so I'm in a little bit less of the, uh, there's a very high traffic area over by the museum and by the uh, Conservatory of Flowers. I am at the other side at the, it's called the um, the Rainbow Waterfall. Mm -hmm. And I made, a, um, I made a, uh, I painted in a labyrinth. So my, my wife and I really love labyrinths. And so I wanted to honor her in painting this very green labyrinth. And the waterfall itself is also green. So it's a green on green on green. And uh, if you look at the bottom, there is a peony from the left corner to the, the left bottom corner to the to the left top corner to the right top corner to the, so just if you look at, you know, if you do kind of a clockwise. Um, Blooms. So, so yeah, it's a bloom, exactly. And so, just seeking that here, here it is. Here's a drone shot from the sky. Here's a kind of a bird's eye view of it. It's it's and, kind of funny, Josue, about this work that like most people will experience it on the ground and, and the, they, they'll have less of a sense of all that, that that really it is this drone view that gives you all the the kind of the um the movement of it all. 
Yeah, I mean, you could, you, I, I think it's pretty. You, you can kind of see what's happening on the ground, but yeah, it's, it's true. It's this drone view that kind of gives you a view of it. Although, yeah. although I guess if you go up on the waterfall, you can go up there. Maybe you can see it from up there, it's right? True. I think I have a shot of it. I can show you. Uh, I might have a video of it. It's just kind of people enjoying it um, in these different ways. Here's an in-progress shot. Um, I use a, a kind of an ottoman stool to lean on to kind of save my back. Because right? a lot of artists were busting themselves just working on these. Because uh, it's a, it's kind of murder on the back a little bit to work facing down. All right, here well, now we're back to Folsom Street, Folsom and Twenty Third. Here's the Birds of the Americas piece. Um, I I've I've been terrible about measuring these, but it's at least 120 feet long by about 25 feet tall. Wow! And it's this mixture of spray paint and mural paint. Again, the birds have a lot of significance. Um. Uh to you know the americas which is why i call them I, the, the the toucan and this this particular um this particular uh bird here uh on the left the orange and green one is called the torogos which is the national bird of el salvador here sorry let me um do a little bit of repair here i'm gonna close this so um yeah it's a national bird of el salvador and um i always kind of include it as a little bit of a mascot to some of my work here's a piece in my actual neighborhood it says we are resilient in spanish uh, faith hope and love uh, and it features like a kind of a postcardy image of san francisco oh, we, we had a question about the last work um this one yeah sherry asks um why did you choose a peony this reminds me of the ad adapter for 45 records on a turntable <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks like that. It does look exactly like that. I, I actually, I'm a record collector. Maybe that subconsciously worked its way on there. I did this with no rulers and no sort of straight edges. It was just literally wow. kind of a, a compass. And um, a compass and a string, basically. It's like a, a piece of uh, crayon and a string. And we just, it was just designed in a way that was kind of simple. And we used the, the width of the roller as a measurement tool. Um, and so what was the question again? Oh, that was the question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, it was just, it was just, it was just, uh, done in that way. Uh, I, I do collect records and I love records. I might've subconsciously gotten in there. Uh, in the, yeah, I had a lot of leftover green paint, so I kept using it, um, for projects. Uh, there's another kind of ones with the birds. You can see it's a kind of recurring, uh, the, 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 the parrot is a very powerful, um, bird for, native cultures both in central and south america and spaces like new mexico uh they they found feathers of uh these red birds the quetzal is, is a mythical uh bird of of the mayan and the aztec um the torogos like i mentioned is a national bird of el salvador and the toucan is very meaningful um nikki you mentioned the diego rivera um, when the Diego Rivera was brought from City College to um, to the SF MoMA uh, to be temporarily housed there, mm -hmm. um, they invited Acción Latina and several other organizations to just throw parties there and just bring community out and kind of hang out. And as that, as a part of that, they did these really amazing, um, these really amazing um, like mini mural festivals. And so. As a part of that, I did this kind of in the style of Diego Rivera. Yeah. Um, and is, that, real, is that in real, the, the alley right uh, outside of the uh, gallery? It was. It was. It lived in the gallery outside of, uh, sorry, in the alley outside of the gallery at the SF Museum, at the SF Museum of Modern Art. And it was, um, it was um, commissioned by them, but then later it was gifted. The, this piece was gifted to Acción Latina. So now it lives in their space, um, which you can visit. You can just have to kind of like, you know, ring their doorbell and go in there and see it, but you're very invited to go see it. And so here I'm honoring, once again, Rene Yanez holding the no eviction and the mission sign, and then Diego Rivera, and, and actually, well, really the mission community as well. And then doing this very much in the Diego Rivera style. Uh, you, you know, one thing you do that, he does is you 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 have actual people like one of the things I love about that mural is that you know you there's a guide that can tell you who all the people are in the mural oh, and, yeah. and you were talking in the very one of your very first ones about like these people the models for these are people I know yeah yeah it's which, true 
would you like an update on the mural? My friend sent me a statement about it. Would it be okay to talk about hey. that for a second? Sure. Yeah, this is about the Diego Rivera mural being moved back to its home at City College. So my friend who's on one of the organizing committees for that says the mural is now fully supported by the current chancellor and the current board of trustees of City College. The chancellor found funding to make up for the extra cost incurred since prices for materials during the delays caused by previous chancellors. Uh, the design has been finalized and I believe sent to the state architects who have to approve it. We estimate restarting construction in fall of 2024, but there is a big pro new problem that the San Francisco County MTA, the Muni people, MTA, the Transit Authority, wants to eliminate all car parking along Frida Kahlo Way, previously Phelan Avenue. And this would make access to college classes impossible and the MTA wants to implement their plan starting this month without any input from CCSF or the neighboring communities. This would also deprive people of the ability to drive up, just driving along the road and parking in front of that mural, maybe during the weekends, to view it, you know, through those through the big windows they're gonna have there. So there are still some obstacles there, but the reason it was so important to move, move that mural and have that performing arts center there at City College is because it's going to be a real focal point of art on this side, you know, near the Excelsior, near the OMI, near the West side, because most of our art now, much of it, especially theater takes place way downtown and not everybody can get way downtown. It's, it's going to be a draw for sure. Yeah, there's, there's, yeah. So having it at City College, where it was for so many years, is very important to us and to our communities, especially the working class, the essential workers on this side of the city. So I'm really glad to get that report and share it with you. Okay, yeah. thank you. <laughs> so, Josue, why don't you continue telling us about this? Is, is, so these people that are depicted in this, these are, um, who are they? Are they friends? Exactly. Yeah, they are. Um, this is Rene Yanez, who unfortunately also passed away. Um, and he was, again, one of the founders of Galeria de la Raza and worked in a space called Somarts. He's actually, it's hard to say this stuff without sounding kind of <clears throat> exaggerating, but, you know, he really, you can't underscore the the value, uh, what Rene contributed to the mission and to the San Francisco arts community and to things like Day of the Dead. You know, I think it is a household name now, and I think one of the reasons why is his contributions early on um, to you really using it as a art installation idea. Below him, uh, the two women with the hats are, they're known as the Wonder Twins. They're the two twins that um, run the African-American art complex that were hugely uh, also inspired and mentored by Renee. And uh, the three young people with the drums are local bloco drummers. And in the spirit of Diego Rivera, who put himself always in the murals, there's a little uh, self-portrait, kind of almost right at the center. Uh, the, the the artist holding the palette with the pencil in his ear, that is me. And <laughs> um, unlike Diego Rivera, I also wanted to really kind of empower young women and young creators. So there's a woman there painting the, the San Francisco scene uh, and actively painting it. Then there's a paletero, you know, not... Not to be totally anonymous, but you know, it's just a, a guy who's pushing an ice cream cart. He looks like kind of on a cartoony way. I enjoy the you know caricatures, and then there's also um, uh, a photographer with the hat backwards uh, that looks a lot like my friend Harvey, who's an amazing photographer. He shot several of the images that you saw. Um, we have a comment. I love the touch of the swirls and the flowers coming out of the spray can. Sarah says. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And La Frida. La Frida's right there in the middle. Oh, yeah. Frida. Frida Frida's a, that's a pin that Rene used. He always um, had her smoking a joint in some of his work. <laughs> wait, so wait, I missed that. Where's Frida? In... So if you look at the spray can, kind of right dead center, uh huh. then you look tiny, a little bit to the left and below. Oh, yeah, of course. Oh, sure. Yeah. 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 Um, one, it... There's a question. So um... colorful. Excuse me, Rodney. Go ahead, Paco. This is actually so colorful. 
that reminds me about uh, uh those decorations like flowers too. It, it it's also so nice to see the low riders represented right there yes. in, the, in the bottom in the middle that's really classic san francisco mission yeah yeah we have a question uh, from yeah. sandy in in chat she says have you spoken of the black and white checkerboard motif my family's from el salvador and a lot of our salvadoran art uses that too no, I and I, I was going to speak about that. Thank you. You're very uh, perceptive. That's a great question. I, I um, as a, a Salvadoran American myself, I I throw that motif in very often, and I think it's exactly for the reaction that you just gave. Um, I want my um, it's kind of like a little bit of an inside joke. It's like a visual kind of giving away of who I am. You know, I think if you pick up on it, you'd be like, oh, this. You know, if you, you look at it, you don't know. You're like, oh, that looks like cute little houses it might be some sort of you know latin american thing but if you're central american it really feels like home uh and so it's a motif that i include even subtly in many of my works just to let you know hey you know like we out we we out here as they say uh for, for my central americans and i just um it's actually you might find it in you know keychains or key holders or different things that you would pick up at a artisanal market in El Salvador or Guatemala in this case, and sometimes Honduras and Nicaragua. Um, but it's actually by uh, the design. The design is, is, is a throwback uh, and an homage to an artist. Uh, his name is uh, Fernando Yort. Yort, two L's, O-R-T, Yort. Um, and uh, even the National Cathedral in El Salvador, I don't know if it still has or once had his artwork on the outside of it. And so I always kind of hearken to it. Um, I don't know, here's just some random photos of me next to some of my works. Here's one that I did in tribute of Alex Nieto. Um, oh, I'll, yes. Can you go back to the Alex Nieto? Mm -hmm. uh, where is this? Is this this a... is just part of my own personal collection. Um, uh, yeah, this piece, yeah. Um, it, it for a moment in time, it was really, um, I guess, the icon that was used um, for the movement. Uh, uh, you know, the people, the, the family of Alex Nieto were pushing for yeah. justice for him. Um, yeah. They asked me to do a, a memorial for for Alex Nieto, and that uh, project ended up ultimately um, falling through. And so, um, you know, oh, I, I keep it there in my in my catalog, but. Oh, I, I don't always keep it very prominent, uh, even though I'm very proud of that work. Can you remind us of his story? I, some people in the audience may not be aware of it. I know, I know he died tragically. He died tragically at the hands of um, SFPD. And um, the police was called on him um, because a new neighbor, uh, you know, it speaks to the gentrification of the mission. A new neighbor um, was essentially frightened by him. Um he was wearing a 49ers coat, a red 49ers coat, and he had um, a bulge in his jacket uh, that looked like a gun, which is actually a taser because he worked doing security. And so um, I don't want to get too into it because the story goes on and on. You can look it up. There's this piece by Rebecca Solnit called Death by Gentrification. Um, and it's a story of Alex Nieto. Uh, or you can just Google Alex Nieto and figure out his story. Um, but essentially, the police were called by this new neighbor. And within, I don't know, a minute or two of the police arriving, um, they had shot Alex Nieto or shot at him uh, over 50 times. And wow. so it was really a tragic story of uh, police uh, police overreach and police brutality um, within our own city and in our own neighborhood. And um and so, yeah, you know, the idea uh, you asked in your questions, um, Rodney, the, the 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 role of of the artist and kind of Diego Rivera's ideas, and I have in my website there that you know sometimes the artist Diego Rivera said that you know the the artist should be the conscience of their era, and I take that to heart. You know, I want to be the conscience. I want my art to be conscientious and bring up some of these hard to talk about uh, issues uh, in our community. Um, I also feel that artists should really be the um, the imagination of their community and really provide a window for things beyond what we can actually see and and, and what we've experienced. And so, this is a one of those moments where it was you know it's it's beautiful and, and heartbreaking and powerful all at once. 
Thank you for speaking about him. He has a special place in my heart. You know, he was just waiting to go to work. He was having a burrito, just like a lot of, you know, typical young guy in, in the mission up there in Bernal. And, and he was violently and just killed for, for, for no good reason. There is yeah. a nice memorial for him as you walk up Bernal from the um, mission side and you can walk past um, a small memorial for him that will be replaced with a with a permanent larger memorial for him i'm not sure when that what the time frame is for that but it's yeah that's correct yeah, yeah i'll let to go up there and visit that and it was so sad because you know his parents were took up the cause against police brutality after that and you know i lost my son around around the same time and his, they had they shared the same name so i think that's why Alex Nieto means so much to me, but, you know, at some point as a parent, I've been able to come to some peace with it, but his parents are still fighting for this cause against police brutality, and I don't know when their hearts are ever going to be able to rest, you know, and that's what I think is a, another tragedy of, you know, part of this bigger tragedy. I couldn't have put it better myself. It, it's just a a really uh, difficult space to be in. And I think the the family is really our fighters and they will fight to the end uh, to yeah. get, to make yeah. sure that uh, he's not forgotten and that there is some, some form of justice that is done to, you know, in, in this case. So yeah, that, that is a really powerful yeah. um, story. And I think um, if people would like to, and maybe should really um, follow up on the story of, of Alex Nieto, and uh, support the family and in, uh, in their cause for justice. I, I certainly still support and love them very much. Thank you. We might take a moment right now. I think it'd be a good idea to take a moment to to pray for Tim and his family right now. You know, this is the right time. So, dear God, please bless the family. Please bless Alex in heaven, and please continue to protect and love us all today. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. That's a powerful experience Thank you. and a powerful moment. Um, yeah, these are just kind of random things that I were doing. I was doing, just keep going with the work uh, I was doing in my graduate school experience. Here's, um, you know, the idea of transnational gangs and what had happened um, back and forth between uh, El Salvador uh, during the 80s. Um, and so I really wanted to talk about um you know, the, the transnationality of gangs. I was interviewing a lot of people who were deported. And so the idea that, you know, young young kids left El Salvador in the 80s, uh, a lot of them orphans of war, uh, and then were raised on the streets of California, so Los Angeles, San Francisco, and adapted to the Chicano gang culture. And then, you know, with that gang culture is, you know, the tattoos and the look and the clothing and the swag and the oldies and the you know, the icons. And then and once again being deported and then taking that California culture to a post-war El Salvador and then that gang culture becoming um, flourishing, really. Um, and then the government really responding by instead of helping these young people and giving them resources and educating them, um, really kind of giving up on them and in many cases, the police crackdowns uh, became extrajudicial killings and um, political desaparecientos, so, so the, the disappearing of young people. And so I really wanted just to comment on giving up of a generation because truly this is my generation, right? I got lucky in that my migration story brought me to a place like San Francisco and like I told you, during my difficult times of losing my father and lose and of loss and, and of just being angry as a teenager, I was able to find art. You know, and these young people, um, you know, some folks found gang culture instead. And so I really have a heart for 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 what's happening in Central America um, with gangs. And even to this day, the, the current president is celebrating his victories of, of uh, cracking down on gangs and uh, making the, the space so safe for tourists and for people who want to come spend their money in El Salvador, but really at what cost, right? So the 
um, you know, the crackdowns and the brutality against these young people who aren't giving a chance, given another, a second chance. Um, I can go on for, for many days. It's a very rich image, but I, I took the images of, you know, inspired by um, the Japanese cartoons like Astro Boy uh and the california kind of big boy burger figure right um this kind of like classic americana image but then remixing that with these real these you know i took the real the tattoos from a real a real guy you yeah. know and kind of just just um, a real person and i kind of just added them onto this figure and the airplane you know representing transnationality and, and the skulls and it's just really um you know, stuff like these gangs, it, it really is the legacy of war. And I wanted to talk about that legacy of a, of a very um, U.S. kind of sponsored uh, war. And so I just uh, am trying to talk about the Central, Central American experience from a different point of view here. Uh, I take a lot of my cues from music. And so in this case, the idea of jazz being kind of a political statement, but also being a, a statement about um, utter freedom. So I, in much of my personal work and stuff that I'm not doing murals, there's just kind of abstraction, and kind of freedom. And so I really enjoy, um, you know, uh, doing work that is fluid and free, which still there's lots of hints of, of politics and, and, and movement. So these are, are these like uh, paintings more? Like these are painting. These are both canvases. They're 36 by 64. Uh, they're all kind of uniform. Um, I always make paintings for myself. I never make them bigger than what can fit in my car. Uh -huh. <laughs> do you I do open studios, Josue? Uh, I do not uh, because I work mostly out of my home. Um, so I don't like, <laughs> always like having a lot of people at my house. <laughs> yeah. But if I ever would, were to just sort of, get in a studio I, i'm searching for one now if you know anybody uh, i'd love to have an open studio and just kind of partake in a community that way um yeah so some of these some of my work really is um just taking taken from pages of my um taken from pages of my sketchbooks that i really just kind of adopt um adopt some of that these are really really these are just really big paper pieces this is about 100 inches by maybe 35 inches um that's big yeah here's another one this one's about i don't know it's like maybe at least eight feet long um oh, we've one, got native, native americans in this one kind yeah of. we got some native americans looking at uh pointing at the, the ships that are arriving you know, and uh you know the 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 uh the skull sort of the, the jack-o'-lantern uh, kind of being um, kind of reminiscent of, um, you know, uh, uh, Alice in Wonderland, the lion. There's a little uh, a hooded KKK figure smoking a cigar, not unlike um, almost dead center, right to the right of the lion. You see him smoking a cigar, not unlike oh, uh, yeah. the art of... Um, uh, why am I forgetting his name here? I, I know I'm, he's I'm, one of my heroes, Philip Gustin, who's right. a celebrated painter. And wow. so, just a big remix of images here. Um, I, I often take from again old Americana imagery, storybooks, children's illustrations, graffiti, you know, um, classic paintings and and, and book imagery uh, to make my own sort of. Uh, what does it say up there in the clouds? In the... It, it's a collage of stuff. So I, I, it's several things in here. I don't... Uh -huh. Cuentos, cuentos viejos y nuevos. So uh, old and new stories. Oh yeah. And uh, cuentos de varios países. So stories of many countries. countries. So these, you know, a lot of that stuff is just stuff that I find, like in uh, textbooks for kids, and I'll cut them up. Uh, and so you can see some of these look like cutouts because they are so cool that's really cool i like the way you use the maize at the bottom to look kind of like the chicken figure the bird figure oh yeah it's really maize that's yeah cool. it's kind of just trying to remix a variety of different imagery mm -hmm. and then when i this was installed at the uh, day of the dead exhibit in 2016 2017 2016 or 17 um, at Somarts, and it was one of the very last ones that was curated mm -hmm. by uh, Renee Yanez, who I continue to talk about as one of my heroes and mentors. 
And so I will often put up the piece. You can see it's made of paper. I'll put up the piece and then I'll continue the imagery right onto the wall. So it's kind of a installation, inst installation and mural uh, mm. that speak mm. to the larger, they're kind of like footnotes or um, you know descriptions of the piece. You like filling up lots of space, I, I see, Josue. Yeah, I try to be very busy uh, with it. Um, here's another Day of the Dead piece. Uh, sorry, forgive me, it's a Somarts piece. Um, that was put up uh, in 2011, 2010 or 2011. And it was a Salvadoran exhibition for um, the Salvadorans in the room um, called Mourning and Scars. It was um, 20 years after the signing of the peace accords. So it would have had to have been, forgive me, it had to have been in 2012. Were you part of that big exhibit at the De Young in 2009? They, it was to... Um... It was like a for the new book, the book about the murals in the mission. I and was a big thing at the at the yeah. the young. I was, yeah. I'm, I have a the P, the Balmy Alley was still being worked on at that moment. So um, the authors put in an in progress photograph mm -hmm. of that of that pro, of that in the book. And so there, if you if you look up the book, there's a piece of that piece is there, but it's not oh. done. It's actually barely started. You know, I wonder if you ever met my son, A.J. Trezvenia. I know that name. Do you have a, I bet if you tell me his graffiti name or his street name, I would know. C.K. C.K. and Ruckus. C.K. was his crew and Ruckus was his tag. Yeah. Yeah, I know him. No. Yeah, yeah. I know of him. Yeah, yeah, oh for God, sure. This is a miracle. And this is my son who's who passed away, whose birthday's coming up next monday this is like a really hard time of year for me yeah but i but these these things come to me yeah you know like me meeting you like this this is just such a gift yeah a well i i think that's the power of of making art in community is that the people that are doing it are your neighbors they're the real people of the city and so you know your son who participated in the mural grew up with swato as i did yeah. Um, we all end up sort of knowing each other because it's, it's such a small city. I think it's something really powerful about the city of San Francisco in that way too. So yeah. I'm definitely happy to talk to you offline and um, look up some more of his work. I'm going to definitely call Suaro. Yeah, the, the piece and, behind me that I put on the sofa is yeah. the one that Suaro did for AJ. I don't know, and oh, now wow. you can't see it from that far away, but yeah, it, it's got a lot of AJ stuff in it, you know? Yeah, it's so yeah, wow. I did that for him after he passed away. Yeah. 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 When did when was this? He died in two thousand and nine. Wow. On my brother's birthday. Yeah. So sorry to hear that. Yeah. I know. Thank you. He was a wonderful person. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I'll catch up with you later. Yeah. No. My I'll, artist I'll with you used me, Nikki. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Paco. Mm. So, so we are getting to um. It's at two o'clock, so we should probably wrap. Yeah. Um, but. Josue, boy, this has been fantastic. Um, thank you. You know, and Nikki, thank you so much for suggesting this. Um, I think we need to do more of this kind of thing. It's um, a, a very special aspect of San Francisco uh, culture that we we have these amazing murals. Um, one of the things I've been doing over the past few years, I'm, I'm a tour guide in the city, is telling everyone you've got to go see the Pan American Unity mural at SF MoMA. It's a must see. It's one of the best things that's ever been shown in the city. But I think it's also true, Josue, that um, the murals you've done and the murals that that are so prevalent in the mission is something like no one should really come to San Francisco without experiencing them. So, so what are your thoughts about Josue about where where your art fits into San Francisco culture? Um, well, you know, unfortunately. And it's true, you know, we've been losing artists um, to gentrification. Some of them have been passing out of old age, like Yolanda and Renee and, and natural causes. And so we have to give them their flowers while they're here. And I think um, also, along with giving people their flowers, it's just listening to them, you know, listening to their stories and listening. You know, I think we, if we have some elders um, in the room, just to know that elders 
to me are a library of wealth. And whether you're an artist or not, or whether you're just someone who's experienced stuff, whether you're a migrant, whether you've been in San Francisco your whole life, whether you're, you know, whatever your story is, you've got a lot to give. And I think, um, you know, to find a youngster to really give that to is really, really key. And so I think in showing you some of my work, and I really wanted just to show you that, like, we do listen, you know, as young people, it's really important that we sort of take that in and continue to honor it. And so I really see myself, I'm kind of in the middle. I mean, I'm, I'm in my mid forties and uh, 43, actually early forties. And I am able to hear the stories of my elders and also be able to teach the kids in the teens and in their twenties. And so I really see myself as a mid-career artist that's keeping alive some of these traditions and then passing them along. Yeah, it's, I, it's important to do that. I think um, it's not going to happen on accident. You know, I think we really need to push those uh, in a purposeful way. And so, um, yeah, you know, I'm kind of a holder of the baton is the way I see myself and uh, a holder of these traditions. I mean, murals have become very popular all over, not just in San Francisco, but we've got the Bay Area brand of it, which is unique it's powerful and it has this intersection with the cultural and the political in a way that's not true in other places and so i think that's what makes us unique i think that's what makes even the bay area latino experience right um it's not you know all, all love and respect due to the chicano culture um it isn't solely chicano you know i want to give my love and props to chicano to the chicano culture because that really gave the central american experience a, a great bed to arrive at when we did in the 70s and 80s but it's it, the 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 Latino experience in the Bay Area and in the mission. It's Chicano. It's Latino. It's Mexican. It's also Central American, Salvadoran, Guatemalan. It's South American. You know, it's black. You know, it's it's just got all these different shades of, of identity within it. Right. There's all the you know, all the, all the, then all the young kids with the Latinx and the queer experience and the BIPOC. And there's all these different ways to describe it and experience it. And I think there, that's what makes our, our experience here in the Bay Area unique. And I think it's great to sort of hold it and listen to it and pick it up. And, you know, like my mom says, hear it all and keep what's good. You know what I mean? I think what's going to stick is going to stick. And uh, so I think it's great for us to just kind of hear each other out and um, keep the parts that, that we can grow on. And, you know, the parts that not so much, we can just at least hear each other out. And so I think that intergenerational conversation is really powerful. I think it's where it's at. And I think um, it's what's made our experience very, very unique. And so uh, I just wanted, again, to continue to pass that along. The last slide I have, can I just say one last thing, sure. is the Acción Latina. If you asked me to speak about it, I ran Acción Latina for four years. I didn't mean to ever be a executive director of a nonprofit, um, but I did. And it was like running a small business and it was very, very challenging and beautiful and stressful and amazing in every way and so um i ran that space for four years um uh, if you all know maybe you, you don't know acción latina but one of their projects you may know is the el tecolote newspaper el tecolote newspaper which has been free and independent and bilingual for the last 53 years uh they've now started a podcast so you know if you're um if you want to listen to some great stories, you can check out their podcast, which is the El Tecolote. And see, I think I have some slides. There it is, the El Tecolote um, that was born from the the SF State strikes for ethnic studies. So the birth of ethnic studies, which is a very Bay Area thing, uh, and the birth of El Tecolote go hand in hand. And so uh, I'm very proud of that. And so if you, um, you know, even if you just, you know, um, if you can get up and get around, you can find it in most businesses in the mission taco places, uh, bakeries. But if you can't, you can also subscribe. And if you have a friend okay. that lives far away, who's, just so subscribe. Who's, who's way we, should, we need to sign off. All um, right. Just want to say thank you. This has been fantastic. Um, and thanks, everyone, for tuning in for this great, great show.